Hey, this is Matt Reisinger with Reisinger Homes. Welcome to my video blog dedicated to building science and fine craftsmanship. Hey, we're on part three. Thanks for hanging with us. Without further ado, here's my friend, Christoph Irwin. Okay, thank you, Matt. Here we go. We're gonna be doing part three today on VRF mechanical systems. Originally, we had told you that part three would be on outdoor units and part four would be on indoor units. Instead, part three is going to be on some of the principles related to system operation and on the components more generally, including interconnections and controls. And then part four will be on outdoor units and indoor units. Brief reminder, VRF here is standing for variable refrigerant flow, and we're going to be discussing that going forward. Brief reminder in who I am, I'm Christoph Irwin, Positive Energy. This is what we do here, Building Science Consulting. We do high performance HVAC design, enclosure design, energy modeling for net zero. We do very high quality performance testing, extremely important. Testing and diagnostics can uh, be said to be where the rubber meets the road on your buildings. Everything else could be in the category of wishful thinking. We also do a lot of education, outreach, and advocacy. Bottom line, what we try to do is engage homeowners, architects, and builders to remind them that high performance homes are real and they're an option that should be considered. We try to support them through that process and ultimately we want to transform the industry. Our goal is to uh, increase the comfort, durability, safety and efficiency of the built environment generally. We're not going to be talking about VRF forever as a company. This is just where we believe the industry's next step lies. There's a lot of exciting changes ahead, uh, radiant cooling, desiccant-based evaporative cooling systems. Um, the disclaimer again, none of these companies are supporting this. We are a neutral third party, uh, just talking about what we believe is interesting and exciting out there in the industry. So we're going to be talking a little bit about what constitutes high performance HVAC, and uh, then we're going to jump into VRF systems specifically. I want to open the discussion with a reminder that something that we all know, technology evolves. It's a natural consequence of our society. And one area we've all seen it evolve is from carburetors to fuel injection. I bring this up to say that fuel injection didn't replace carburetors because carburetors didn't work. Carburetors worked fine, but fuel injection works better. Similarly, the current mix of products that are out there on the market and out there in our homes, they work. They can be made to work better. And that's where, where our discussion is going to lead today, I hope. So vapor compression cycle is at the heart of an, our current um, mix of air conditioning systems. There's, don't worry, I'm not going to go into that diagram. I do want to point out that it's a very simple, robust process. It can seem complicated, but really there's basic principles at work here that everyone can understand. Um, and what we're talking about when we're talking about VRF equipment is we're talking about how to take the inputs, the same inputs, and get more of the outputs that we want from this equipment. If you look at that muscle car at the top, I think that's a 66 GTO, pretty sweet car. He used to love to rebuild motors and transmissions. Um, I had a uh, Chevy van actually for years. So that engine in that car is extremely powerful. It takes the fuel and it gives performance that no one can deny. However, that engine at the bottom, that ultra low emission vehicle, it is taking the same inputs, the same fuel with the energy stored in it, and it is working through uh, highly engineered systems to take that fuel and extract increasing amounts of energy from it and in so doing it releases uh, lower emissions on the back end. So thinking about the vapor compression cycle as something simple, I want to talk to you this this idea here. What if I said to you there's a bucket of water and I want you to move it outside the house using just a sponge. Well what you would do is you dip the sponge into the water it would absorb water that's a natural process you don't have to coax it into absorbing the water. You take it outside and you squeeze it or you compress it. Right? So inside we're absorbing the water 
outside, we're squeezing the sponge, we're compressing the sponge, and the water is being released. Similarly, inside our buildings, right? We have the inside unit. Inside, we ask it to absorb the heat that's in our space by flowing the heat across cold coil with refrigerant moving through it. Outside, we compress the refrigerant to release the heat. Uh, it works in the reverse uh, in winter, but it's a very simple, reliable, robust process that the industry is currently in the process of uh, optimizing and making more efficient. Every component in there, right? The compressor, the coil, the expansion valve, the fans, every motor. It's being looked at carefully so that we can take the inputs, which are electricity, and get the outputs that we want, which is heating and cooling, and, and optimize the efficiency. So beyond that, there are some basic principles for high-performance HVAC. And this is slanted towards my climate, towards hot, humid climates. Um, possibly, let's not get into a contest here, but it's a very challenging uh, climate to deliver comfort efficiently in uh, without incurring negative side effects. So step one, design, build, and test a very high-performing enclosure. Uh, step two, do your load calculations for your mechanical system. This includes uh, your heating and cooling loads, sensible loads, as well as your humidity loads, your latent loads. There's a little asterisk on latent because the software tool, the uh, standard that we use, ACA Manual J, it actually underpredicts latent loads um, significantly. Um, 30, 40 percent is not unusual to find that underpredicted. More about that later. Just contact me. Our contact information is at the end. Um, the third ingredient in a high-performance HVAC system is providing for variable capacity operation. And by part three here, you should be clear on what that means. Uh, the fourth principle is to use multiple indoor units. You want to separate these by the load they're going to see and how they're going to be used. Right? Is it day-night? Is it party loads? Is it equipment loads? Is it upstairs, downstairs, which would be different loads? Um, the fifth principle would be, in, in keep in mind for hot humid now, we are providing supplemental dehumidification. We're providing explicit humidity control. And the next two, providing ventilation and makeup air, um, those are less and less um, discretionary. Every home should soon, if not now, be providing makeup air. And every home should currently be providing ventilation air. I'm referring to homes being remodeled or designed right now. That last one can't be stressed enough. Rigorous third-party testing and commissioning on your residential buildings. So now we're going to be jumping into VRF principles again. A little bit of a recap. What we have, the home in the middle there is subject to varying loads on the left. The uh, loads would be coming from the gradually and incrementally changing weather on the outside. And this is going to translate into varying loads on the mechanical system on the right-hand side. And this means that the loads, which are variable, are going to be lining up with mechanical equipment capacity, which is also going to be variable in, in an efficient context. So we, can, we know that loads vary. This is a sample of a manual J showing uh, loads varying throughout the day. That's time across the bottom and load going up the y-axis. We've talked about this one before. So variable capacity air conditioning equipment is the next logical step in our industry. And it's, it's currently being taken. It's not a new step. It's, it's new to a lot of us, but uh, across the, globally speaking, it's not a new step. So variable capacity means we have an accelerator in our mechanical equipment. We don't just have an ignition key. And at the heart of it is this inverter scroll compressor that we briefly touched on. And I want to go a tiny bit deeper now, uh, talking about what that does. That inverter scroll compressor takes the energy from the grid, which is at a 60 cycle per second frequency, and it converts it to variable frequency on the output. This is what gives us the variable capacity output. Here's a little diagram of that. On the left side we have the uh, 60 cycle power coming in and you can see I've compared that to the pedal part uh, of the crankshaft on a bike. Right? So you crank in your pedals at 60 cycles a second 
you want a steady cadence, a steady load on your legs there. And then the back wheel on your bike can be spinning faster or slower, depending on whether you're going up or downhill. So very similarly, that's, that's what the inverter compressor does. It takes that control signal, it converts the 60 cycle power coming in to um, a range of frequencies going out. And th that range actually depends on manufacturer, but 15 to 115 is not unusual. So that variable frequency compressor is paired up to a variable refrigerant flow metering device. Uh, it's alternately called electronic expansion valve or linear expansion valve, EEV or LEV. Um, conceptually, again, uh, it is related to a hose bib, a spigot. And water would come in on the right, you use the spigot handle at the top there to control the amount of water that leaves on the left. Similarly on that valve, the refrigerant is coming in, it uses um, a circuit board to control the metering of the refrigerant coming out. Here's one example of it. The, the difference, the functional difference there is that there are thousands of pulses between full open and full closed. It's as though you could ask somebody to uh, shut your hose spigot um, six one thousandth or quickly then reopen it uh, 14 more one thousandth. So this is done by a microprocessor based control. There's a little solenoid in the top there. Uh, and those two together, the linear expansion valve and the inverter scroll compressor, are at the heart of all the VRF systems we're going to be talking about going forward. So keep in mind now, we're talking about VRF technology, multi-split technology as well as one-to-ones. And I'm keeping this purposely at a, at a relatively high level so that we can get through it relatively quickly. Any one of these areas, any one of these products is a jumping off point to get deeper. And I encourage you to uh, jump in either on your own or by working with somebody that can help you with these designs for your buildings. Okay, VRF mechanical components now. Let's talk about them. We have uh, essentially uh, three main categories. We have outdoor units, indoor units, and then um, controls and distribution. So the big takeaway you should get from this slide is there are many types, many manufacturers, many different system types out there, many different components. Conceptually or functionally, they're similar. The differences are in their specific specs. Here's an example. Um, on the left we have a Fujitsu system, uh, a one-to-one -one on the left, on the right is a four-to-one. I would point out here, uh, Fujitsu has a pretty cool feature with these uh, concealed ceiling concealed ducted ceiling cassettes is that they can actually go in other orientations. They are multi-poise cassettes, so they can be put vertically in a wall, not just horizontally in the ceiling. That's a big deal. Um, one of the things this VRF equipment does is solve problems for builders and architects about how to incorporate mechanical equipment into increasingly clever and complicated uh, building structures. So terminology. Um, I just mentioned multi-splits on this slide. It's a little bit out of order. Uh, let's talk about multi-split versus mini-split. Uh, mini-splits are typically one-to-one. One, um, one indoor unit to one outdoor unit. And uh, the mini part of the mini-split used to refer to the fact that these systems would go down to a half a ton whereas typical equipment would, would bottom out, the smallest size would be about a ton and a half, depending, a ton and a half or two. So they were mini compared to the normal split systems. Um, that, that is still true, but you can get mini splits in three ton sizes, right? So it's not always that they're mini, that they're smaller than regular one-to-one -one conventionally ducted equipment. Um, I'll also say that, at least here locally, mini split typically refers to one-to-one -one wall units, and that's not really right. Really, mini split is anything that's one-to-one, -one and um, whether it's ducted or, or non-ducted is, is not the distinction. And keep in mind that this really changes, I guess, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, but if you're talking to me, multi-splits are one-to-many technology, right? So you have, still have a VRF outdoor unit, but it connects 
to many indoor units, each one of which is independently controllable. So the important point here is not to get hung up on the specifics, but just to understand the meaning of what you're talking about. And I have found a very useful way to do that is to get familiar with one manufacturer. So pick one. Pick a manufacturer that is well supported in your area locally, that you have access to good uh, tech support and information, and get familiar with their product lines. So that would be the left side of that arrow on the bottom. You get familiar with a unique manufacturer and, and what they call their products. From there, you can map over to any manufacturer's products and you can make them specific and functional for your application, right? So you could get familiar with Daikin equipment and then map it over to Mitsubishi or LG and map it over to Daikin um, or any of them, Fujitsu, Gree, Sanyo, Toshiba. There's, there's so many, um, it's very hard to keep track of. So now we're going to jump in properly here to the three main types of um, mechanical system components in the VRF world. So we have indoor units and outdoor units. That's pretty obvious. We also have a controls and a set of interfaces to work with. And then the last one that's often overlooked is refrigerant distribution. Uh, it's not as simple as, as just running refrigerant lines, although it's not much difficult, much more difficult in some applications either. So refrigerant distribution, there are branch boxes. Oh, excuse me on that title there. Uh, branch boxes, splitters, and joints. So there are, there's lots to say about these. There's lots of rules about where you can make connections and where you can't, and whether the boxes are very complex, as that one shown in the picture from Mitsubishi, that's their BC controller, or if it's a simple manifold, or even simple T's put in there. But functionally, you can look at that outlet strip to understand what they do. The refrigerant plugs in at the outdoor unit, and it gets distributed to the indoor units. That's what's happening. Uh, on residential equipment, we're looking here at uh, Mitsubishi products, six concealed ducted indoor units, all connected to one outdoor unit. Each indoor unit has its own control, and there's refrigerant distribution equipment that connects them all. So those are your main categories of products, indoor units, outdoor units, controls, and refrigerant and distribution. Uh, there are also a number of accessories that can be um, added on to VRF systems. Filter boxes are very convenient when putting on concealed ducted. The alternative would be to use uh, filter grills. There's a conversion kit for a filter box to convert the unit, or for the unit actually. The conversion kit converts it from a, a rear entry to a bottom entry. Um, so from depending on the application, you might need a conversion kit. You can flip some of these units over and you, you would do that using a downflow kit. And there are times where you'll need wind deflectors and snow deflectors, deflectors on the outdoor unit. There's also ERVs that integrate directly with this equipment. The controls uh, link them. And there's also dedicated outdoor air systems in this product space. Let's talk for a few slides about controls now. This is, uh, if anything, this is an area where VRF equipment has probably the most diversity, the most um, range of difference between different manufacturers. Um, but generally speaking, in terms of similarities, there are central controllers, uh, wireless controllers. These can be on a wall or uh, in a handheld remote. And then there's a range of in input and output modules that can take different signals and, and uh, open dampers and things like that. We'll talk more about that in a slide or two. And there's also the ability to sense uh, temperature remotely. It can be sensed at the controller, it can be sensed in the return plenum of the unit itself, or it can be sensed remotely. That's a useful feature depending on the application. So this slide on controls, it's related to VRF, but it's actually related more generally to controls because I believe we're all hearing by now that we build a very high performance enclosure and it saves a lot of energy. And then the next opportunity to really make meaningful energy saving savings is through changing occupant behavior. And this means that you, the occupant, are part of the comfort delivery system, right? You know whether you're comfortable or uncomfortable. So one of these uh, happy coincidences is that 
we're getting a lot more ability to remotely access and remotely control our equipment. So this means we could be sitting on the couch and take our phone and lower our thermostat or, or raise it. We don't have to get up, don't even have to reach for that remote. It might be mounted on the wall across the room. Um, we're also having the opportunity with um, web-linked controllers to optimize control based on uh, tiered rate structures that are time variable. We could have anticipator functions that know the weather is about to change and start to preheat or pre-cool your home. Um, the possibilities are really endless. It's really good news. So when it comes to web linking and your ability to control from a portable uh, web link device, talk to your manufacturer, get real clear with what you want, what you expect, and make sure that they can deliver that. Because as I mentioned, there is definitely a larger divergence in those areas than in other areas. Um, and some manufacturers are behind, frankly. And uh, I'm fairly confident they're all moving that direction as quickly as they can. It's quite clear it's an important direction to move. Here's another area that's somewhat weak uh, with controls, and that is that our dampers are, are based, still based like, on um, signals that aren't readily input and output, certainly in a residential context, from typical manufacturing, manufacturer's controls components. Uh, in a commercial setting, it's less of a problem because you can buy one of these controller modules and they could be two, three, four thousand dollars, but you're controlling 50 or 100 dampers with it. If you just want to open one or two makeup air dampers and the manufacturer says, well, you'll have to buy this two thousand dollar electronic gadget to do that. That's a problem. That is definitely a problem. Uh, or at least uh, financially a problem. One good news is that I, we're recommending strongly to use supplemental dehumidification and their control system can handle uh, interfaces with your uh, ventilation dampers, certainly, and if you're clever, even with your makeup air dampers. So um, bottom line on controls is, you know, this is sort of um, the big three locally here in Austin, Mitsubishi, Daikin, and LG, their wall-mounted controllers. You can see they're very similar. One thing that's a bit of a disappointment for me is that they're actually quite different and each is proprietary. Um, I don't know if everyone's familiar with this, but this is very similar to the late 70s, early 80s in terms of the automotive emissions control circuits. Every manufacturer had their own components, their own control signals, and it caused for the consumer uh, increased prices if something broke because, you know, for instance, Audi shown here, only one person made the Audi control boards or the Audi uh, valves or dampers, something like that. And then they standardized. That industry standardized and the consumer was the big beneficiary. So I'm really hopeful that across the controls spectrum uh, that VRF manufacturers start to standardize and start to provide um, Controls that are broadly useful across a range of product categories, not just ju not just theirs. Okay, summarizing here, we have uh, outdoor units, we have indoor units, we have controls interfaces, and we have refrigerant and distribution systems, and those are what uh, constitute the areas of VRF components. Okay, uh, I guess I can't really take questions in this format, but feel free to send an email or uh, post a comment when Matt puts this online. And there's our contact information directly. Uh, there's an example of one of our mechanical layouts, which I know you can't read in this format. Okay, I'll see you in part four.